All right, I'm back again. Ben, thank you so much for that, that uh, input and talking about the salmon. That's something that uh, uh, you know, I know everyone wants to hear about. And quite frankly, I wanted to hear another two hours of your information <laughs> and so on. There's so much more to know and, uh, and certainly a lot, a lot of interesting stuff. What I want to do is we're going to try and finish up our discussion now. And, and I, I want to hit on a few things that are going to be a summary of things we've talked about. In other cases, I still have some, some new things for you to, to learn about and so on. But I'm going to start with an idea I refer to as stream concepts you ought to know. Uh, you know Ben had mentioned, and I think it's really quite valuable, that you guys are the ambassadors out there in the river and teaching people about our river here and also uh, about stream ecology in general. And so there's lots of things, you know, when you're, you have slow times and you're drift fishing and so on. And, and uh, you know, this is something you can be talking about or little ideas. Uh, so let's talk about some, some interesting ideas that you probably want to know. As a review, remember we said that stream diversity declines as you go higher in latitude. So we here in, in the northern latitudes have streams that are much less diverse than they are elsewhere. The food webs are simpler, they're less complex, and by being less complex they are certainly more vulnerable to any perturbations that happen. And that of course means that, that they're fragile and we then as, as users and, and and people that live here want to maintain these streams and rivers and the biota so that your, your grandchildren can see them too, uh, we have an obligation to be better stewards. And, and I hope that you'll take that serious and pass that on to your customers as you go. Uh, let me talk about a few other things as we go along. Winter seems like a cold time right now. It's cold out there. Uh, but it's a very busy time. There's a lot of things happening in our streams right now, even though it seems like it's cold. Uh, for example, that organic material that was dropped in the fall. Remember all those leaves that we said fell in there? And they're going to be processed by insects and by other organisms, and, and they're gone. So sometime in the spring when, you, when the things start warming up and you get a chance to walk down to the river, look for leaf packs. They aren't going to be there. They're pretty well processed and gone. The carcasses of those salmon, those hundreds and thousands of salmon that were gone uh, or that died are pretty well processed too. They're pretty well gone. They've broken down and have been broken down into the small minerals, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and so on, and are now being incorporated into the trees nearby. The eggs that were laid in the fall and in the, during the summertime uh, have settled down into the hyporheic zone and, and grown, and they've turned then into alvins. They've used up that yolk sac that they had and, and are, are now out there feeding freely and starting to come up out of the gravels uh, in the springtime and starting to either move into lakes. In the case of the, the red salmon, they're moving up into small streams like the, the kings do, heading for the oceans like the chum and the, and the pink salmon do. Uh, or heading to backwater areas as, as these cohos will do. Uh, they're starting to you know, get ready and to finish up you know, to, uh, to move on to the next stage. The insects are growing there too because some of the insects have delayed uh, growth and, and so on development and so they develop later in the year and later in the winter. We also find that the diatoms and algae that are there are, are able to pick up some light through the snow and through the ice and so we do get some photosynthesis occurring. So there's lots of things happening under the ice. It's not a sterile time, although it may seem like that because we don't spend much time out there looking for it. I did point out for you in the past, but I want to spend some time with that, that our northern streams are nutrient poor. Now when I say nutrient poor, what I mean by that is that those things like, well, if you buy a fertilizer at the, uh, the hardware store or at the uh, garden store, uh, it's going to have numbers on it. Let's say it happens to be one you're going to use for orchids. It's 15, 15, 15. Those numbers refer to the concentrations of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. That's what they refer to. And those things are, well, that's how you fertilize your garden by adding those nitrogen and phosphorus, potassium, so that the plants can pick it up and use it and grow. All right? But our streams here tend to have few of those nutrients. There's not a whole lot of them. And that means that you don't get a whole lot of production. Uh, and what 
of course, Ben talked about organisms that are anadromous, like our, our salmon. The nutrients levels are very low in the stream, and so this, the fish can't survive there. They have to go somewhere else, and they go out to the oceans where it's nutrient-rich. And, of course, that is the whole idea of the anadromous scenario, that the nutrient levels are low in the streams. They can't sustain the, the number of fish that are there, and so then they go to the oceans where it's nutrient rich. Let me give you an example. When you think about chum, or excuse me, the, the coho salmon, they tend to spend two to three years in the stream, and they grow to be literally about three to four inches. That's when they go through smultification, which is where they form, they start heading for the oceans, and they go out into the ocean, and they come back usually in one year. And when they come back in one year, they now weigh 12 pounds. Think about that. To go from four inches to this big, and they are the most aggressive of the, of, the, uh, of the salmon. They are the fastest in terms of movement of the salmon. And so they're very predacious out there, actively feeding. And that tells us that there's a lot of groceries out there in the oceans, okay? A lot more food out there, and they rely on that. So now they've grown to full size, mature size, and they can come back, okay? So kind of an interesting scenario that our streams are nutrient poor. Incidentally, on the East Coast, as Ben mentioned, the streams there are nutrient rich and the oceans are nutrient poor. And so you have things going the opposite direction where the, the eels go out to the oceans and spawn in a nutrient poor Sargasso Sea and then come back to the streams on the East Coast to, uh, to grow until they're fully mature. Remember those carcasses that we saw, the dying fish? We didn't know, I remember a long time ago, we didn't know why that was, why that was part of the whole system. You know, why were there other organisms that would reproduce many times when they were that big? But yet here these fish were dying shortly after they re reproduced. There had to be some altruistic benefit to the, to the overall population. And so what we now know is that these nutrients, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium from the dead salmon end up into the hyporrheic and get picked up by the plants, get picked up by the algae and the diatoms, and they in turn then feed the insects, which in turn then feed the salmon. So in a very circuitous route, we have that altruism occurring. The death of the parents actually does benefit the young in the following years because there's more leaves coming into the stream, there's more algae and diatoms for the, for the insects to feed on because that is the food for our, our young salmon. So those carcasses are pretty important and this marine drive nutrients, as Ben mentioned, is a big deal. And we can show that in places where you don't get salmon, you don't have that benefit of these extra, uh, these, these extra nutrients. All right. I want to talk about the edges of our streams. In one of the videos that Ben showed you, you saw some of the small salmon fry, or, or the par, I'm sorry, and, and the par, incidentally, par, those are the par stripes that are the stripes on the side of the salmon. And, and they're hiding in these small places where the current's not very fast because they can't swim in fast current, okay? They need to be around the edges, one, for protection, and two, because the current is slower. And so those edges are the nurseries. Those are the places where the, where the young salmon are going to grow. You know, we, we have signs up wherever our schools are to lower the speed limits and so on because we have schoolyards. Well, here we have nurseries. The fish nurseries need to be protected as well because that's where they get their shade, that's where they get their protection, that's where they get their their nutrients and protection, as I said, from predators. So it's very important, those areas around the riparian habitats. So not just, not just on the streams, but in the, on the lakes as well. So protecting those riparian habitats is very important. You know, we've already talked about the leaf input and all of that, but it's also the nursery area uh, for the young salmon. There's some interesting creatures that are found in the Kenai River drainage and ones that are really kind of fun and some you've probably never even heard of before. But I'd like to tell you a little bit about them. Uh, in many of our streams, we have 
freshwater clams. Now, sometimes we have what are called fingernail clams, little bitty ones, but there's some other larger ones that are kind of interesting. They, uh, this group of mussels, uh, I actually found them in a stream that I was working on. I was collecting insects, and, and I happened to see a whole pile of these clam shells, and I thought, why would somebody dump clam shells here? And, and then I realized, who would walk in, you know, half a mile into a stream and then dump their clam shells from something that they caught. And it, of course, turned out, when I looked more carefully, this was a place where otters had been coming in and feeding on them, and they were breaking them open and feeding on them. And, of course, I found otter slides and so on nearby, so I knew what was going on. I've also found a number of places where bears have come in and will feed on these as well. Incidentally, if you ask the question, and I've certainly asked this question of a colleague, that... Uh, I asked a, a colleague uh, who is a, an anthropologist uh, and I said, do the natives eat these? I've asked a number of people, have the native populations utilized these, uh, these mussels? And the answer is no. Uh, we went back and looked at all of the photographs that we could find from museum collections, from various digs and midden mounds here in Alaska along the... Along the uh, interior of Alaska and looked for freshwater clamshells and there were never any clamshells that were freshwater. We found marine clamshells but they didn't eat the uh, uh, they didn't eat the ones from the freshwater which is kind of an interesting scenario. I've, I've talked with people from the Midwest and some of the native groups there that have fed on them and they say they kind of taste muddy. I can't tell you whether they taste good or not. I haven't tried them yet. But, but the fact is that bears and otters will feed on them. So they're in there and in our streams. And by the way, what do you think they feed on? They are a filter feeder. They feed on those fine leaf fragments that we talked about at the very beginning of my presentation. They're one of those guys that feed on those very fine particles. All right, here's somebody else. And you probably never realized that we have sponges in our area. We have freshwater sponges in our in our streams. Uh, and interestingly, I had not seen them. I was working on a particular stream and I brought back some samples to look at and was looking at under higher magnification some insects and I saw the gemules, which are the reproductive structures of sponges. So then I knew, okay, I got to go back and see if I can find the sponges. And of course, I, as soon as I started looking for them, there they were. Uh, these are about a quarter inch in diameter. They're kind of a hollow tube and they grow kind of like my fingers are sticking up and they force water through themselves and they too feed on fine organic particles that are drifting through the water. So just like they would in a, in a marine habitat, these little sponges are feeding on fine particles in the freshwater habitat. So again, they're not something you're going to see very often unless you really go looking for them, but there are sponges here and they're kind of interesting. And there are certain insects that feed only on these sponges. So, uh, you know, again, you don't have one community without another community uh, being involved and playing a role. All right. I want to talk about the insects that I work with. I work with a group called the Chironomidae, or Chironomids, or midges. Midges are what they're probably best known for. They are the most abundant insect in the Kenai River. And they are certainly the most abundant insect in any freshwater habitat that you happen to go to. I used to tell my students that if you go to a, a stream or a lake and you don't and you sample for the insects and the most abundant cr insects you find, if they're not the coronamids, you didn't look hard enough. Your net was too big because the small ones are getting away. They come in all sizes. They come from some that are only three millimeters in length as, as, uh, as adults and others that are much bigger, maybe an inch in, in length as an adult. So they can get to be very big and, of course, very, very abundant. In work that I did in the Chattanooga River up north of Fairbanks and also out on Kodiak, I was able to, to estimate the numbers of coronamids that emerge from a meter square area of the streams that I was working on, those two streams, and it was between 100 and 175,000 emerging coronamids per year. Now you think about that, you know, an area this big by this big, that surface area is producing 150,000 a year. And that's just the ones that are actually flying away. They've completed their life cycle. Because these are the most abundant creatures, they're also the most sought after by 
by our fish and by our other insects, the predators. So how many didn't make it? You know, I can only guess it's probably twice that in terms of the numbers that were actually there. As I said, we now know of, I have on my screen here, it says 86 species, but I, I have found a couple more. There's 88 species that I've documented from the Kenai River. That's quite a number. Uh, they feed on, some feed on algae, some feed on diatoms, some feed on fine particulate leaf fragments, some are going to feed on carcasses, some are feeding on their neighbors. Uh, you know, any role, ecological role that you could play in a stream, there are some of our coronamids that will actually play that role. And of course, because they're so abundant, they're the main food source for most of our young salmon as well. In work that I did, Fish and Game had me come up and look at the Moose River smolt, uh, the coho smolt one year, and virtually everything we found in their guts were coronamids, pupae and larvae and adults. So they're you know, a massively important organism, and they're very tiny. They're related to mosquitoes. They look like mosquitoes, but they're not. In fact, here's what they look like as a larva. Uh, sometimes they're bright colored, sometimes they're red, sometimes green, sometimes uh, orange. Some are, are almost blue, they brown. Some are very clear. It really depends upon the, the particular organism. Uh, and they're found, as I say, virtually everywhere uh, in every stream habitat you can imagine. As an adult, they look like this. So this looks like a mosquito. It's very tiny, looks like a mosquito. By the way, if you look at this carefully, you'll notice that the antenna on this creature is, is somewhat plumose. It's kind of feathery. That means it's a male. Only the males have a plumose antennae. The females do not, okay? And you have seen these every time you've gone down the river uh, and you didn't realize what you were seeing. When you were drifting along on a on a warm day, you saw a big cloud of insects along the river. That big cloud of insects was probably coronamids. The males beat their wings at a particular frequency that produces a sound that becomes irresistible. It's an irresistible siren song for the females. The females fly into the cloud. A male will clasp with the female, and because they're very light, they'll drift out of the, out of the air, and by the time they have reached the stream or are ready to fall on the ground, they're done, the female has mated, the male flies away and dies, and the female will fly away and start laying eggs for a few days. So these are very, very abundant and certainly the most abundant insect in the entire Kenai watershed. All right, let's talk about something else. Change the subject a little bit. How do you kill a stream? How do you destroy it? Well, maybe that's not what we want to do, but let's understand what things will do it. Clearing the watershed of trees and vegetation is going to really have an impact on your stream. We had big fires and we clear away vegetation and clear cut areas that will destroy the streams in the area. Okay, so that's something that, you know, we want to be somewhat cognizant that that when you buy some property along the river, don't go clear cut the streams don't or the, the, the trees don't cut all the vegetation away because we already know those trees are producing the leaves that end up in the stream that in turn feed our insects that in turn feed our salmon. So make sure we are valuing that riparian vegetation and the trees and vegetation around it. We want to make sure that we don't have a lot of organic pollution in there. Remember this is a stream. These streams here are nutrient poor. So if you have organic material from your leach bed drifting into the river, that's going to end up adding nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which changes our stream, changes the players. Uh, that's not a particularly good thing. So avoiding that kind of pollution in our streams and in our lakes is important. A friend of mine has a home on a very nice lake. He built the first home on that lake, and now there's probably 25 homes on there. And he noted to me that he said after 25 years or 30 years, I'm seeing a lot more vegetation in the, in the lake. You know, lots more nufar and nymphaea and, and uh, various potamogetans and so on. Uh, and he said, why is that? And I said, well, because you've got all these homes around here and everybody's got a leach bed and those leach beds are gonna drift some nutrients back into the lake. And now with increased nutrients, you have more production of plants. And that's what he's seeing and, and it's, you know, not to a scale that it's something that's got to do, correct it, but the fact is that's what's going on. 
The next thing we mentioned is alien species. Uh, ben showed a picture of, of pike and described how the pike can have a devastating effect on the, the lake uh, or the body of water that has this new species in there. In some places, you know, we had, there used to be a, in the Great Lakes, there was this huge fishery for lake trout. And along came the lamprey, the Pacific lamprey that got in there, and it decimated that population. The whole fishery disappeared. Uh, there's lots of other cases like that. The quayug and the, and the zebra mussels are, are problematic. There's lots of organisms that, that might come in here and might survive, but when you bring in some new creature, you now create a massive problem and, and disrupt the, the ecosystem and all of the components. You mess up one place and everybody else gets affected. So we want to keep our alien species out. Uh, we want to be careful of, of developing in wetlands. Remember, wetlands are not only going to be that channel between the stream and other aquifers and so on, but they're also going to be a sink for water. If we go back to a place in Monroe County, Monroe County is in eastern Pennsylvania along the Delaware River, and in 1953 they had a huge, huge uh, rain event something like 17 inches of rain fell in a single day. And every single bridge in the entire county, except for one, wa got washed out. And that one bridge that didn't get washed out was the bridge directly below the only bog and huge wetlands in all of Monroe County. Because that bog and wetlands acted as a great big water sponge, held the water so that it got moved out slowly and didn't wash out that bridge. And it's kind of interesting. It's, it's a, a very old bridge built in the 1800s. It's, it's still standing today where all of the other bridges in, in town and throughout the uh, county were washed out because of that, because your wetlands act as a big sponge and a big nutrient sink and nutrient source for other water bodies. We need to be careful of some other compounds, organic compounds like, well, gasoline. <clears throat> some of you know that we used to be able to run uh, two-stroke motors on the Kenai River, and we realized that we were dumping gasoline into the, into the waterways to the extent of 10,000 gallons a year. I mean, that's how much was actually going into the river until we changed over to the four-stroke motors. Uh, but there are some other types of toxins that are around. Maybe you've never seen this, but if you look at some of the trucks that travel down the highway, uh, some of the small, t uh, and I say tanker trucks that have like a small tubular tank, well, those are tanks of acid that's very heavy, and that's why you can't carry very much of it at one time. But if we were to have one of those trucks end up in the Kenai River, we would s cauterize a section of the river, just sterilize it for uh, miles and miles. And and so I'm pretty excited right now that they're building a bypass from Cooper Landing so that they're going to bypass that. We hope we have those trucks carrying those chemicals, can't have an accident and end up in the river. You know, I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody on any particular thing. I'm simply saying that, that we want to keep those types of compounds out of, our, out of our river so we can have it for the next generations. Remember I talked about the silt and fine materials that get into a stream that would plug up the hyporrheic. That hyporrheic, as we said before, is so critical for the spawning of our salmon. And that's, of course, we want to keep that out. When we're doing construction, we need to be very cognizant of protecting our, our rivers. Another area that has become critically important, and even now we're seeing more and more of it, and that is temperature regime changes. Uh, temperature regimes Remember, there are limits in terms of the amount of oxygen that the water will carry as the water gets warmer. And salmonids need a great deal of oxygen. And so we have seen in places where the water got so warm that the salmon couldn't be active or it got even warmer that they actually died. And so that's critically important to us that we make sure that we pay attention to the temperature regimes and make sure that we are not going beyond the level that our salmon and other organisms can sustain and survive, okay? Because we can s exceed those, and we've seen that already in places like the Deshka River last summer. 
I think overall, if you take any particular aspect of the river or any part that we utilize, whether we're talking about, you know, fishing or we're talking about any other aspect or withdrawing water for some sources for water treatment and so on or diluting water from water treatment plants, uh, anytime you overuse an aspect of a stream, it's very difficult to get it back. Once you overuse it, you're going to lose it. And, you know, once you lose it, it doesn't come back. If you talk with folks who live in Washington and Oregon, they talk about the salmon that they used to have. And they wish they had done a better job and been better stewards of their waterways. If we go and look at places like, and I'll use the East Coast, they used to have Atlantic salmon uh, from New Jersey all the way north up into Nova Scotia and so on. And now almost none of the states in, in the United States have Atlantic salmon spawning. I met a guy who was a fisheries biologist who was working on reintroduction of the Atlantic salmon on the East Coast. And in his 10 years of work, he had seen 10 fish return. I'm sorry, three fish return in 10 years. Think about that. Imagine what would happen if we let it go and we didn't have any salmon. How much different our community would be, you know, the, the importance of our salmon. So if we lose something, we're not getting, we're not going to get it back again. We need to be good stewards. And with that, I'm going to quit and say, uh, if there's questions, hopefully you can, you know, hopefully when, when these are played, we can be there by, by a Zoom and be available for questions. And we both, Ben and I, will welcome any questions that you can have and try to provide you with more information if you need it. And with that, I think I'll call it quits.